Hey everybody, we're gonna get started in just a second. Thank you very much for joining. Okay, cool. So yeah, Charles and I are here in person. This is Charles Waldron. My name is Rob Beardsley. We are uh, on the acquisition side for Lone Star Capital and Charles has uh, worked very hard to put together the trade tracker that you see uh, in front of you now. And we've also carefully um, taken away some of the more sensitive information. So this isn't exactly what we have on our end, uh, but when we're actually collecting the data, we do have every deal, uh, all, all the metrics about the deals and, uh, and, and you'll see more specifically what we're talking about here. But the point of this webinar is for all of us to get a better insight into, um, well, most specifically our deal flow that we're collecting, uh, but how that can hopefully speak to the broader uh, market and I'm, as I'm sure that, you know, what we're looking at in our major markets are reflective of what's happening around the country. And um, so, and we'll be comparing, now this is our third trade tracker webinar. So we'll be comparing quarter to quarter, how things have changed and, and if, if they've changed at all. So um, for starters, let's just do a quick recap and I'll let Charles walk through the template itself. We will be sending out a template version uh, unfilled out of this spreadsheet. And uh, as we always do, we recommend that you take the template and implement this for your own deal flow. It's a great way to act as a KPI tracker to make sure, all right, am I sourcing and underwriting the number of deals that I want to be per month, per quarter uh, to keep myself on track for my acquisition goals. And then it also allows you the opportunity to create insights into your uh, pipeline as far as pricing, you know, what do the best deals look like? What are the metrics that make the deal, uh, a deal the best deal and so forth. So yeah, Charles, why don't you walk us through the, uh, the template a bit more? Uh, sure, yes. Yeah. So I mean, just in terms of what's in the template, um, I mean, usually we would have the deal name, I guess, uh, as the first column or the, the second column next to next to market, but uh, you know, we're kind of just uh, anonymizing a little bit here. So. Uh, yes, yeah, so a deal name, you know, kind of basic profile. Um, and for off-market deals, those numbers are rounded down to the nearest 100. Um, and then we've got uh, you know, vintage. So just the, the basic stats to get a sense of like what you're looking at. And then, you know, uh, price per door, um, square footage pricing um, as well. Um, and then the absolute deal size, uh, both uh, the guidance and, you know, where we liked it, which of course, if we liked it, it's going to be the same uh, as the guidance. And then, um, you know, cap rates. Um, so uh, cap rate going, so both at the, at the guidance price is the left three columns and then uh, at kind of our bid is, is the right three columns. So, you know, I guess the left three columns of, of that green field kind of are gonna show more, um, you know, how the market looks in general. And then the right hand side is gonna kind of be like where we would like things to be and and then where they intersect, you know, maybe there's something you can, you can do a deal. Um, yeah, so let's, let's stick on that a little bit more because that might be not as clear. So go back to the green. So, so as Charles was saying, we've got the underwritten cap rate. So at the uh, guidance pricing and typically when we get a deal, we identify what the strike price is or the guidance price, the whisper price. So we know what what the seller's expectations are. And then we underwrite the deal at that price level to create these metrics. So when we say if we're missing some labels here, but the first three uh, UW cap rate, yield on cost spread, that's referencing the asking price essentially. And then the following three columns is in regards to the price that actually we would purchase, you know, what, what price we like the deal at. And like Charles said, if those intersect, then theoretically we should be able to buy the property. So you can actually see over here, column Y, the hit rate, uh, which is our price versus the guidance pricing, right? Theoretically, like I said, if it's 100% or more, that means we like the deal enough or we like it at, at, at the guidance price. So, you know, most of the time, as I'm 
I'm sure all of you are familiar with. Uh, you know, you're not hitting the guidance price, and you're you have a, a bid ask spread, and that delta is what precludes you from you know getting a deal done. But there are other reasons um, for the deal not to get done. As you can see, we have quite a few deals here that our pricing is over the guidance pricing, and there can be various reasons for that and why we did not end up purchasing the property uh, in spite of that. So for example, a, a, a recent trend that has occurred over uh, for sure the last couple quarters is property selling in excess of pricing guidance. Um, you know, we've heard brokers say that they put a deal package together, they, they provide a broker opinion of value to the seller, and then they actually take it to market and the property sells for way more than that. And the brokers, you know, almost feel embarrassed because they essentially undersold the market capabilities or market expectations. And so we're hearing that that's happening quite a bit. And uh, that is one reason why we might be able to hit the pricing guidance, but that's not enough, right? There's the bid ends up going for, we've heard example deals going for a 110% or, you know, 10% over the pricing guidance, 20%. And I don't know if maybe that sounds pretty high. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and outside of uh, our markets, I mean, I've heard examples in Phoenix and Atlanta of, of 40% over. So that's just ridiculous. But so that, that's one reason. Um, can you think of any other reasons why we might be at the guidance price, but we still end up not really wanting to buy it? Well, I mean, it is based on each deal. So, I mean, it, it could be idiosyncratic because about the underwrite, you know, where maybe like it's just not the most up to date. But I, I think, you know, or if not, not really. I mean, right, in principle, we pursue it to if, if we can, but there are all kinds of reasons besides price that deals don't happen, you know. Um, so, yeah. Okay, cool. And also for everyone that's on live with us, you know, we, encourage you to ask questions in the middle of the presentation. Also, you know, we'll have time for Q&A after for specific to the webinar, also just general about our acquisition, uh, our acquisitions process. So feel free to jump in in the chat, uh, or you can even unmute yourself and we can have a conversation. But we'll be jumping around here from topic to topic and uh, hopefully you get some interesting insights. So something that's on my mind is the market versus off market conversation so can you update us on that well i mean in terms of the number of deals you would say yeah i mean i think that you know as to the market's been kind of heating up and people are more certain that they want to sell and they're seeing good results with selling but a lot of time people are choosing to go with brokers um you know and do a brokerage sale process i mean they're always going to go with brokers usually but like to do a brokerage sale process and go through the whole you know auction and, and all of that and so um you know i think our, our, our kind of fraction of uh, marketed to off market that's kind of um it's gone up slightly since q2 but it's, it's still down from you know q1 um uh, so yeah and, and actually um the total number of marketed deals um has stayed the same and yeah so so it's not as big a shift as it sounds we've actually seen 26 you know off market deals this quarter we saw 34 off market deals in q1 so you know it's, it's as much that that, you know we've just been looking at more stuff and i think there is more activity now so yeah as a percentage that definitely there was a lot of off-market activity early in the year there's a lot of uncertainty still uh you know last year was a very low transaction volume year and so sellers weren't certain of the market they wanted to test the waters and there's a lot of reputational risk associated with going out to market formally and then for whatever reason you don't transact right that looks uh, bad in the market. So sellers wanted to avoid that. But then as more, as Charles said, sales successfully went forward, more and more sellers got the confidence, that, okay, yeah, the market's on fire. People are hitting their numbers. And so brokers and owners are compelled to go through a full marketing process to get prices even they didn't think were possible. Uh, Frank asked, will there be instruction on how to use this uh, spreadsheet? So no, not really. We can share, um, you know, we can kind of share on, on Zoom now about how how to input some things, but it's pretty straightforward. And also you can make it your own by customizing it and changing up the columns. You might think some of the columns are valuable. Some of them are not valuable and you can just get rid of them. But, you know, essentially the way that you fill this out is 
every row, as we discussed, represents a deal. And in order to get this data, you actually have to underwrite the deal fully, which, you know, that's obviously a, a lengthy, different process with rent comps, sales comps, and knowing the market, budgeting, and all that. And, but then once you have that underwriting, then you can actually take uh, all the metrics from your model and, and put it in here. So, yeah, like I said, take it and make it your own. You can make it much simpler. And I'm sure there's ways to make it much more complicated. Um, so we'll take a couple more questions and then we'll jump into some more insights on our end. Uh, but Ed's asking about the difference between bigger and smaller uh, or, or bigger, smaller spread between bid and ask. So yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll use that question to segue into the topic about kind of pricing, where it's gone quarter over quarter and, and where that results as far as uh, the bid to ask gap. So what Charles just pulled up here is the, uh, the percentiles across Q1, Q2, Q3. And it's, it's a lot of numbers, so it's not really easy to kind of have the new, uh, the, the, first column. the insight jump out at you, but you can see the bid to ask on, on the first column and you can see, um, so I guess we'll take the 50th percentile and Q1 was 92% was the was the bid ask gap or so eight percent is the gap and then in q2 the 50th percentile gap was seven percent so not much of a difference and then in q3 the gap was again eight percent so really the gap has uh stayed the same now of course this is our bid to ask gap uh we don't have market data about about this but so this is reflective of how far we are in our underwriting from the asking prices and you know our underwriting is always changing and we might be getting more aggressive, might be getting more conservative. One thing to note though about the validity of this data is that the deal set itself, in our opinion, has stayed pretty consistent. It's not like one quarter we're looking at 2010 properties and then the next quarter we're looking at 1970s deals and then the next quarter we're looking at you know value add or, or core plus. So the, the, the deal set is staying consistent. Um, Charles, why don't you show the kind of the deal set metrics? Yeah, so you can see here between Q1, Q2, and Q3, these metrics here. So you see on average, we're looking at pretty much the same uh, unit count. So our average unit count is roughly 230 unit type deals and uh, about 1980 to 1981 vintage properties. And um, that's really kind of all the information we can share, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, average it's square footage. There, yeah. Average square footage also. So we're yeah, not looking. At, it's not like we're looking at thousand square foot deals one quarter, and then five hundred square foot deals the other quarter, and then wondering why price per unit is different. So we're looking at pretty much the same uh, square footage as well. So, um, so that's great. And then while we're here, we can point out that what we've observed quarter over quarter is that. Um, price per unit on an asking basis has gone up 8%, uh, which is pretty crazy quarter over quarter. So the average asking price per unit is just under 108,000 per unit for our deal set. And you can see going back to Q1, it was 94,500 per unit. Um, I do think maybe there could be some skewing now because we've added, uh, we're starting to look at more Dallas Fort Worth uh, property and on average DFW is pricier than Houston. So that's gonna to continue to push our average price per door skew. So one way to kind of uh, level the playing field is to look, focus on a cap rate basis, right? Because cap rate will um, adjust for and you know, greater NOI, greater price per door and, and even it out. But as we all know, or at least we know all too well, DFW has lower cap rates than Houston. So that will also skew our cap rates down as well, which we'll, which we'll cover. But the, the thing to note here as well is pricing has moved up 8% quarter over quarter in our deal set. And our, our pricing, as far as uh, our bid, has gone up about 6.1%. So we've gotten more aggressive with our underwriting, and, or at least our, our, our price per unit has increased in our model. Uh, but not quite as fast as how the how the market is increasing. So it's like we're we're trying, but market's still moving one step faster than us. Anything else on that? 
uh, I mean, I think that's kind of, yeah, I think, um, you know, the pricing has gone, I think, I mean, it's remarkably consistent, I would say, really, like, how consistent a deal profile is, you know, which I think is reassuring, but, you know, really kind of, uh, I, I both, I think, gives validity to the data and, and also, you know, kind of reflects that we're kind of sticking to our criteria. I mean, right, it's like the prototypical deal uh, was two quarters ago, 1980, and, you know, is now 1981. I mean, it's really, um, it's, it's, it's interesting also to see how consistent that is. Yeah, and, and we'll be, we'll be deliberate and honest with the way that our acquisition criteria changes. Uh, like I mentioned, we are now bringing in DFW as a greater focus. So more DFW deals will be on our data set. And in future uh, trade tracker webinars, we will compare the two markets and we'll be able to actually show you the average cap rate difference between the markets, price per unit. Um, you know, what's the average IRR that you can expect in DFW versus Houston and, and whatnot. So the data will certainly evolve and hopefully get better. So we've got some good questions. Corey's asking how close to actuals oh, this one's do we see the broker <laughs> OM uh, pro forma versus what we actually see? And um, if I understand the question correctly, you know, basically saying how much do we trust the broker OM numbers? And oh, you know, the, yeah. the answer is not at all. Uh, well, go ahead. Well, so I guess, I mean, um, how much do we trust? Like, it depends on the OM. I mean, some OMs, like if they really actually, if their pro forma actually shows their value add scenario, I mean, a lot of the time, right? Like the, they'll have the value add scenario where you can get huge rent pops and this and that and all the other ways that you're going to add revenue. Uh, but then if you look at the pro forma at the end, it's kind of just like, well, you know, we're growing rents like whatever. And they, they don't really underwrite all of that in their pro forma. Um, and I, I think the other thing is that, um, you know, the, the market is hot. I mean, it's always been hot, I guess, but you know, I don't, I don't kind of, my feeling is that they can kind of just put a performa that's very defensible there and people are just going to pay more than the performer warrants uh, using their own performance. Right. And so the broker doesn't really need to say anything unrepresentative or strange in the performa because like, that's not what people are making decisions based on. Yeah. That's a good point. What if the brokers are, are honest or even conservative or whether they're way too aggressive, uh, the market's going to find a way to you know bid wherever they see fit so i don't think the oms really are influencing pricing um so you just see brokers with different strategies obviously brokers are sharp they know the market really well and so when they put numbers in that may be bogus in a mall in an om it doesn't mean that they don't know the market they know it they just are purposely using numbers that can be you know a little aggressive and one example of that would be in the rent comps and I think because one of the ways to really push a deal and make it work is just to ratchet up the pro forma rents and and then justify it with rent comps as the brokers do, but they do so with properties that really aren't so comparable. And so one of the things that we do, obviously, it, there's a distance uh, issue, right? If a, if, a comp, if a rent comp is more than a certain amount of miles away, uh, it can be just useless and then the other thing is it could be pretty close i mean a rent comp could be within a mile but it could have completely different demographics you might have incomes of thirty thousand in one one block and then you know just a mile over you might have incomes of eighty thousand, and you can't really compare the two properties and so that's we're always uh checking rent comps and making sure that they're demographically comparable yeah, you know, you can get, yeah. So I think it's always good to be aware of what's sort of actually happening, you know, rather than just kind of looking at the map and kind of taking that for granted. Um, I guess also on the OM thing, I think kind of the OM is also a way, it's sort of, you know, the broker is is, is holding your hand to show you how to buy the deal if you choose to believe it, right? Yeah, the answers are in the OM if you want to know how to make the deal work. It's just, are you comfortable with those assumptions? So. Moving on, Bastion's asking what the split between on and off market deals uh, that we made offers on. So you can see that right here, row 97 and 98. Um, you'll see that we we saw, well, we underwrote 80 deals this quarter. And well, I'm sure we did more. It's just how many made it in the tracker. Yeah, I mean, this is the only ones with complete information. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I think we probably passed on twice as many deals that, that fit somehow, but just didn't really make a lot of sense um for like obvious reasons but i think he's also kind of saying what's the split in terms of like that that you actually LOI? yeah 
Um, and I think kind of, honestly, I think that the, the pricing on off-market deals isn't better. So if anything, it's probably even or slightly skewed in favor of on-market deals. Um, you know, because like the, I guess the theory, right, it's sort of those two trends, right? On the one hand is that, well, it's off market, it's not going to be as bid up. But on the other hand, um, you know, the seller is just kind of, it's just what number does the seller want? Um, they may not be sure they want to sell. Um, and so a lot of the time to make the deal happen, like the broker will tell the seller, well, if I get you an offer at this, you know, will you take it? And they'll say, well, sure, but that's going to be a high number. And so, you know, it's, it's the valuations are, I wouldn't, I would say, better on off market deals. Yeah, you have, uh, in terms of off market opportunities, you have kind of um, a dichotomy. You have highly motivated sellers that might be selling off market and then highly unmotivated sellers that are also potentially willing to sell off market. So it's, it's kind of skewed in either direction. Potentially you can get really good deals off market, but you can also get some jump where people are just kind of testing the market. They don't want to go through a full process. Uh, but yeah, so you can see of the deals that made it into the tracker, which were kind of the most active deals in our pipeline, uh, about 33% were off market. And I would say that we saw more deals, right? We probably, out of this 80, we probably saw 150. And so I would say of the total universe, there's probably less off market. So when we do get an off market deal at the end of the day, we take it more seriously. We make sure that we move quickly. We want to get feedback quickly. Uh, because there are those potential opportunities and, you know, greater time constraints potentially. So we'll, we'll do a couple more questions and then maybe we'll get back to our insights. Um, so Ray is saying, given the inc increase in price per door and the competition in Texas, are we considering other markets uh, or are we looking at in other parts of Texas? And so this is a great question. And the answer is no, uh, or at least not really. And it's actually almost the, it's the, it's the opposite. And this is a, a really great uh, topic, it, which is there's, there's um, this inclination that as the market is more competitive, uh, what typically happens is people go further out on the risk curve. They want to take more risk so that they can get the same returns that they're used to, right? So if they were buying in a primary market like DFW and they were used to getting whatever it is, 14% IRR, now all of a sudden, they can't get that 14% IRR in Dallas. So then they go out to a tertiary market outside of Dallas, or they go to a, you know, a weaker primary market somewhere in the Midwest or Southeast in hopes of that same 14. Uh, when in reality, that same 14 isn't the same 14 because it's based on worse fundamentals and potentially greater risk. So the, you know, the way that we've responded to greater competition, higher pricing, is actually swam in the other direction. Rather than trying to go further on the risk curve to get the same returns that were available previously, we were actually going to better and better locations, better and better property in search of lower returns, right? We're willing to accept lower returns, but we just wanna feel, we wanna be in better deals, wanna be safer. We wanna be in situations where if we have to, we can and will hold for longer. Uh, because that's the safer thing to do, right? The longer you uh, stretch out your hold period, the more you reduce risk. Um, you can take even the safest deal, but if you compress the business plan into a, a year time frame, right, that's a very risky deal. So that's that's our response to increased competition. Is you know we were pre-COVID looking at tertiary markets all over Texas, and we wanted to be, you know, buying those potential deals for a six cap and thinking we were getting a bargain, but those markets end up being uh, the things that go out of favor the most and the fastest in a, in a recession or in a situation where there's widespread um, you know, price decreases, which we don't think that's going to happen, but that's, that's, what, we, that's what we're essentially preparing for and, and protecting against. Uh -huh. Well, and, and you know, these secondary markets and stuff have already seen, you know, that happen, right? So, I mean, I guess with the other primary markets, you know, they're never easy, um, you know, and uh, some of the, like the, the larger primaries are going to be more competitive and the smaller primaries are going to be thinner deal flow. And then, you know, so, so if you have more people, it's, you know, it's not easy to do them in, in the smaller markets. And as far as management, it's better for us, obviously where we already are, but then also the secondary markets, you know, like Lubbock and, and such have seen, you know, big increase already in the last year or more. And, I guess, you know, whether you think it's permanent or temporary, either way, it's, you know, 
it's not like you're going to go out there and find incredible deals. I mean, I guess they, they are on average priced more attractively, but it's not like it used to be. Right. The, there's a compression across the risk curve. So like what Charles was saying is the spread used to be right. Deals are still more attractive on, on an IRR basis or whatever return metric basis you're looking at uh, the more risk you take and the smaller market you go to. Uh, but that spread is getting smaller, right? If, if we're just using the numbers previously of DFW at a 14, right? Lubbock before was maybe a 17, but now things have compressed and DFW has gone from 14 to 12, right? Probably less really, but 14 to 12, two points down. And then Lubbock, instead of going from 17 to 15, which is two points down, Lubbock's gone from 17 to 14. So now there's only a two point spread between. So you're getting paid less, less, uh, return premium for taking that increment of risk. And so that's what drives us to not want to go out on the risk curve and instead kind of pull back. Um, so yeah, great, great question. Jack is asking about DFW, uh, rent growth, uh, spread for disp dispo cap rate. And then yes. So, so in DFW, you know, we have a very small sample size for DFW because we just started plugging deals into our uh, trade tracker, but we are underwriting. So we're keeping rent growth at 3% as the annual escalator, which is low for DFW, especially with the potentially uh, inflationary period we have ahead of us, um, or at least what we've experienced in the last year and what looks like we've got coming in the next couple of years. So the way that we are justifying pricing and baking in the rent growth is through the pro forma rent rather than just adding it into the annual escalator, we're just adding it into the pro forma. Um, so we might add in an extra 50 bucks or something like that, uh, which is another, you know, if we stabilize over 24 months, we might add another, what it would be, 8%? Yeah, something like that. I mean, you know, you can see there are projections out there and you can see there's been enormous rent growth. So there is rationale and applying that, but as far as the, term, especially like with the terminal growth, it's like a very important number. We're not gonna be coming up on that. So, you know, those kinds of numbers. Yeah, and so that is, it will we'll still be, if you look at the CoStar numbers, it'll still be less than CoStar, and and it really does help with the, with the numbers. If you don't do it, there's just no, there's no chance. Um, there's a lot of, a lot of uh, rent growth coming our way, we believe. Oh, and there already has been. And there's already, and there's already been, so. All right, so our, use of leverage uh ed's asking about leverage so we don't really actually have any leverage data in the tracker right no so so that would be an interesting thing to keep track of in the but this is a great uh question to kind of segue into the little debt discussion i wanted to have so so first just kind of our um our use of leverage so we're kind of a especially right now where we are in in the cycle and, and with risk and everything, we much prefer agency financing. If we can get 10 year debt um, with maximum interest only, uh, not because interest only is less risky, it's technically more risky, but we want to maximize cash flow for our investors. Uh, so agency debt is, is our first choice, unfortunately. And we'll go over to the. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So we'll go over to the percentiles here and we'll show you that. How, so first off, if you're not familiar, how do you get agency debt and how is agency debt sized? Well, agency debt is sized based off of in-place income, right? Unlike a bridge lender or a more flexible lender who can look at your business plan and identify future income as a way to finance you today, an agency lender or permanent debt lender is going to look at in-place income. And the reality is, if you look at, for example, we'll just look at Q3, uh, which is the, the blue box at the top. If, if we look at the cap rate ask, which is column AA, you can see the first off the median or 50th percentile cap rate is 3.7%, right? And so why is that significant for financing? It's because for if you want to size uh, for agency le leverage um, at 75%, for example, which is kind of the standard, you need to be at today around 4.7% cap rate. And the reason being is for the DSCR test, the lender is sizing the loan based on debt service coverage ratio. So they're taking the in-place NOI, they're dividing it by amortized debt service, 
And in order for that to be about 1.25 X, so meaning your NOI is 125% of debt service, your cap rate needs to be about 4.7. So you can see as Charles clicked on the cell, you, your, your cap rate has to be kind of, it has to be above the 90th percentile in order for you to even consider agency financing. And that's crazy uh, because it means the vast majority of deals are getting done on bridge today. That is just the reality. Um, there's Otherwise you're stuck doing agency debt at a lower leverage, 65, 60. And that's not particularly attractive to most. So, so for us being, us wanting to do agency debt first, right? It really leaves us just kind of this very small sliver of deals to choose from that we actually could do agency if we want to. And just because a deal has a high cap rate doesn't make it a good deal. It often actually just leaves us stuck with looking at deals that are in bad locations, don't have any future growth potential. Um, and that's pretty much it, right? So buying the highest cap rate is not the winning formula by any means. So, so that's our opinion of use of leverage. We, we like agency, but the reality is it's very hard to find good deals that can actually justify or support 75% agency leverage. And for us, our threshold is 70% loan to cost. We're not going to, so even if the deal can size for, let's say 75% agency financing, we can get max leverage with agency because we're buying a 4.8 cap. Uh, but if we have a big enough CapEx budget, which overwhelms the loan to cost ratio below 70%, we'll still take that deal bridge, even though it could do 75% on agency. And that's just because we don't want to do a deal that's suboptimally leveraged, which in our opinion is that 70% loan to cost threshold. So, so those are the ways that we look at, look at debt. And on the bridge loan side, we're very cautious and we are making sure that the deal passes our stress tests and really that the business plan, the deal and the returns justify the added risk of the bridge, right? We're not going to look at two deals side by side and say, well, this is an agency deal. This is a bridge deal. And they both have the same IRR. And so they're, and they're equal, right? That would certainly not be equal. Um, we are typically looking for a 2% uh, premium for a bridge loan. So if, if, if it's a, if we would ordinarily look for a 13% IRR for this deal, for a given deal, and, and instead it's bridge, we'll now want 15%, which as I mentioned this before, uh, it's really not a lot to ask that 2% increase, especially when you consider the fact that the bridge without even really baking in any re return premium should give you that extra 2% just by way of added leverage. And because we underwrite the bridge on a shorter hold period. Uh, which is three years instead of five years. So that's kind of my last point about debt. On, a, on an agency deal, we'll do a five-year hold and on a bridge deal, we'll underwrite to a three-year hold. So that way we're honestly underwriting the term of the, of the loan to match the hold period, right? We don't have a mismatch there. Um, yeah, and you can see that, you know, the, the similar, the comparable, you know, level of cop rate in terms of percentile was a little, there were higher cops at a given percentile, obviously, uh, I think in the past. So it's like, like what I was saying. Yeah. So if you compare now that percentile for where 4.7 cap rate is, it's just gotten harder and harder to, uh, to actually meet that requirement. So there's just fewer and fewer deals that actually fit into that criteria, right? Which is kind of this bad cycle where the only way to buy a deal is bridge. So then more people are buying deals with bridge. People are buying deals with bridge. That means they're paying more for the deal. And since they're paying more for the deal, the going in cap rates go down. So then it's just more bridge. And so who knows where that's going to lead, but uh, that is an unfortunate reality of the market. Um, Tom's asking about the date um, that's in our model or that's in the tracker here. Um, yeah, this, this isn't, the tracker is not um, like our ongoing tracker. This is really just for the most recent quarter. So, yeah, so I think the, the idea is we, um, when we receive the deal, that's what quarter it belongs in. So it's a good question or a good point because if a deal comes to us in Q1, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to sell in Q1. It doesn't have to sell at all. And it could sell in Q3, but we're going to keep track of it or it's going to show up in our data here in Q1. And we've had some circumstances where 
a deals kind of circled back around where we saw it previously and then it came back alive for whatever reason and we'll re-add it to the tracker for that new new time period. Okay, so now let's uh, let's jump to some other insights that we have. So higher IRR, cap rate compression, capex budget. Cap budget. I like that one. Let's talk about capex. <laughs> so, so, so uh, here we, Charles has some data on capex per unit. And this is, you know, for each deal, this is our business plan. We're projecting to spend a certain amount on CapEx. And if we go to the averages or the, the totals, we have, uh, we've, we've seen an increase in our CapEx budgets quarter over quarter of 6.4% and, and more based on Q1. So if you look at Q1, our average CapEx budget was about 4,500 per unit. And then in Q3, it's 6,500 per unit. and and then on top of that, the real big shift for us is we've implemented a recurring CapEx line item in our pro forma that's below the line. And it adds um, essentially, it, it, we, we typically are doing 250 per unit per year as below the line CapEx, right? So if you're familiar, there's the lender replacement reserves, which we underwrite above the line. And those are typically 250, 300 per unit. But in addition to those in our model, we now have 250 below the line. So we have added that additional layer of recurring CapEx, which in our opinion is conservative and is a way for us to um, hopefully, well, hopefully be conservative on our cash flow basis so that we can over outperform on cash flow because we have baked in that line item of, of extra CapEx every year. And adding in that line item every year of CapEx uh, in Q, I think we added it sometime in maybe right at the end of Q2, Q or beginning of Q3. That adds another about 15% to our budget. So effectively, we've increased our budgets at least 20% on average from the beginning of the year. And if you've been hearing all the news about inflation and, and construction costs going up, I mean, it certainly makes sense. And I don't think our increase really has to do with our change of business plan. It's not like all of a sudden we're targeting deals where we're, you know, going in with stainless steel and granite and, and really upgrading our, our renovation finishes. I think this just more has to do with us being conservative as well as pricing going up for construction. Should we talk about the average, or we can talk about, yeah, average IRRs. We, yeah. We can kind of cover the basics. So, so we look at the Q3 IRR, which is um, in the percentile boxes, it's the column Z. You can see the, the 50th percentile IRR is uh, 11%. So basically what that means, if you believe these numbers, if you close your eyes and you buy the first deal that a broker brings you, you can expect an 11% gross IRR from that deal, right? And so if it's done in a syndication, there's gonna be an acquisition fee, there's gonna be some asset management fees and a promote, and your 11 will probably become a 8% net, maybe 8.5% net IRR. So that's, that's kind of the average return. So you know, this is a hard business to try to go and find deals that are potentially double that in potential return uh, without taking an inordinate amount of risk. So the reason why we feel so that, that collecting this data and then analyzing it this way is so valuable is because we can actually look and see what is realistic. Uh, you know, are we wasting our time trying to buy deals at a 20% IRR or is that, or is that realistic and something that we should be trying to do? Uh, so it's a good way to evolve with the market, right? If, if you were previously successful buying deals at a certain return in 2014, right? Should you be st still seeking that same return in 2021? Uh, I mean, our opinion is no, that you should be a, a relative investor and not an absolute investor, right? The idea is can we outperform uh, the market today? Not can we outperform you know, yesterday's expectations? 
So we're always looking to do the best deals that are available to us right now. And we're also always looking to you know, improve the, uh, the pool of deals that we're seeing. And so if we can in improve the funnel and then also do a good job of identifying and executing on the best deals that come through that funnel, then we know we're actually creating real value and we're doing our best to generate outsized returns. So, so that's why we're looking at kind of the median returns. And also if we look at like 95th percentile, for example, here in Q3, that would be 27 and a half percent IRR. Um, you know, that, that is a great deal. And that doesn't mean, so again, it goes back to the cap rate discussion, right? The highest IRR isn't the best deal. There's deals in this um, data set that, you know, do have a great IRR, but we still don't want to buy them just because the risk we feel is too high or, you know, the location is bad um, or we just, yeah, we have our concerns about the viability of the business plan. I mean, we, we've bought some of these deals or, you know, one or two of them, but, you know, it's not the one that had a 31% IRR that we're buying because that's, that's the operational projection there, right? That's not necessarily, you know, that's, yeah, so that's that's the projection needed to reach the pricing that we put on it for one thing. So, I mean, you know, maybe, you know, maybe our pricing was short, maybe it just, it needed a huge lift to get it even close, um, you know, and if you're still a pass, you're not going to narrow in on like, well, am I 15% off the price or am I, you know, 20% off the price, it's not really worth kind of digging in there. So then you, you, you might end up with some numbers kind of like that. Um, but, you know, it, the 11% is the market return also, where so you can see that like, that still is going to require work from the sponsor, right? So it's, it's, it's a market return, but it's an active management market return where you're going to still be executing the plan, you know, to get that 11, that's the median. Um, and you can see that with the yield on cost there, like from that median yield on cost is 5.1% median yield on cost. Um, so, you know, you're going to buy it uh, at a 3.7, but you're going to be expecting to build it to a 5.1 if you're just buying the median. Yeah, so that's, that's something really scary. Uh, that is a great point. The, so the average deal, and again, these averages aren't necessarily speaking to one type of deal profile. They're just different averages across metrics. But I think the point, the point Charles is making is if you buy the average cap rate of 3.7, the expectation is that the business plan allows you to push it to 5.1% yield on cost to then get you a, a reasonable IRR of 11-ish, right? And that is a lot of risk. So because going from 3.7 to 5.1% yield on cost is that's a big business plan. You have to raise rents, you have to cut expenses. A lot has to happen in order to actually get there. So if you were, let's say, for example, seeking a lower return of 11%, it would be far better to go and find that from a deal that has better in-place income, where you don't have to have such a big spread between your going in yield and your yield on cost, because that implies risk. The greater the spread between your cap rate and your yield on cost, the more risky it is, right? If I can buy a deal for a five cap and my stabilized business plan is to operate it at a five cap, I have virtually no execution risk and I, I'm getting my objective return from day one. So that's another reason why we're looking for deals with better in-place cap rates aside from the agency financing. It's, it's that lower execution risk. We don't have to buy into what the market or the brokers are pitching us of, oh yeah, buy this deal at nosebleed cap rates and then you'll just raise rents 200 bucks and then you'll be, you'll be looking good. Uh, that's, a, that's a tough scenario. So I think the, the problem, one of the risks or the issues with today's market is trying to actually find true value add because it's one thing to find a deal where you have the opportunity to implement value add, you can raise rents and all that, but it's a whole other thing to be able to find that business plan coupled with reasonable valuation, right? Everyone's trying to sell you a value add at nosebleed pricing. It's can you buy at a decent yield and still have the value add, right? If you can have both, you can't miss. So I think that pretty much concludes our insights on, on this for this quarter. Um, you know, we didn't see a ton of interesting changes or you know, think, yeah, so something that we did see last time, which was pretty interesting, was we identified the fact that 
unlevered returns from Q1 to Q2 went down, but levered returns from Q1 to Q2 went up. And that was because of financing. Debt got better from Q1 to Q2. Lenders got less pessimistic, more aggressive. Everyone was back to business. And um, so we saw that as a big as a big change. But this from Q2 to Q3, we didn't really identify any change in debt or unlevered returns um, because it's, it's pretty much stayed the same. Um, Corey's asking about case studies available. Uh, we do have case studies. You can go to our website, uh, lscre.com, and uh, you should be able to find some, uh, some of our case studies on there. Mark asked, with significant rent increases over the last four to five months, what are our thoughts on using T3 financials, gross potential rent, loss of lease, vacancy, concessions, bad debt versus T12? I'll let, I'll let Charles take it away. Uh, okay, yeah, I mean, I think generally we're on T3. Um, I mean, for one, that tends to be higher, um, you know, which is like, well, you know, you have to actually buy a deal to invest in real estate. And if you don't give it the benefit of kind of what's been achieved in the last three months, it's really tough to be able to justify paying enough. Um, I think, you know, we do try and pay attention to what's actually in there. I mean, you know, probably they have tightened up performance, you know, in the last few months as they always tend to do to try and get, but sometimes it's messy, you know, sometimes they've got like a lot of kind of other income, for example, that will come from um, like their turnover that's been happening in the last three months as they lease it up, you know, like a lot of, uh, you know, lease violations and, uh, but, you know, sort of fees for like cleaning and all this kind of stuff where like you can see that all of this stuff is going to evaporate once 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 you take it over and so we'll deduct that um but i mean i think we have to have confidence in our ability to fill it up uh and generally operate well and, and you know i think that you know that the, you kind of have to give it credit um for what's there but but yeah i mean if if there's a reason to not believe that you can maintain that level of performance then i think you kind of just in that specific case you have to not yeah, so <clears throat> vacancy, right? You don't need to penalize the deal for having, you want to be aware of the vacancy trend over the last 12 months and greater if you can, but you don't want to penalize the deal for having higher vacancy 12 months ago than it does today, especially when you're looking at the deal from a financing perspective because lenders even have the discretion to look at T1 vacancy to, to size the loan. So you should do the same when you're doing your internal analysis that so uh, and there's also the market changes like i mean the, the whole you know there's just been absorption at least in houston across the board you know all the properties are going to have less vacancy so i mean i don't know if it really makes sense to expect that to go up and if if you expect vacancy and all these losses to increase in the future your model is probably going to spit out a number that uh, is, is not going to allow you to buy anything um and you would not want to invest in Houston real estate or any other city's real estate if you expect the vacancy and bad debt to be higher in the future than they are now, because generally the market is going to price what is there now. Yeah, and and to Charles' earlier point, you always have to look for noise. So, you know, the reason why they why you use T twelve is because it's more data, and so when you take it into account and or use an average, it's going to be smoother. It's going to be uh, potentially less skewed. But if you take T3, right, and you take, for example, if we use like uh, other income and we take a look at application fees, right, in the summer, there's a lot more application. So if you're taking T3 in the summer, your summer T3 might be greater than your winter T3, and that's going to skew. So like Charles said, you have to be more careful with going down to a T3 or T1 uh, for, for things that can be potentially noisier. And other income is certainly one of those things that are noisier. Uh, concessions are, are cyclical and noisier. And then we're also seeing some things with bad debt right now, as far as the way they're being included, excluded and, and whatnot. Right. Like all the, you know, it's, so for a while, it's like all the bad debt has been COVID related bad debt. Um, and so it's like, if that were the case, they probably do have some real bad debt in there somewhere that's going to persist. Um, and, but I think the other thing is that like, also a lot of this tends to just be kind of case by case where it's like, you know, we pass on the very vast majority of the deals, we're not getting there and everything. And so, you know, um, 
if you look at the deal and you don't love the area, you think that it has problems, you might just say to yourself, well, I don't expect that this deal, I kind of think it's more based, it's less based necessarily on what's in place, and it's as much based on what you think the potential is for the future to justify kind of departing from or sticking in line with the T3 and the T12. Yeah, that's a great question. Not everyone's thinking uh, about that, but um, let's see, specifically asking about rent increase or less four to five months. Yeah, I think all that still stands. Well, I mean, I don't think, I don't think, I don't expect rent is going to go down. Like, you know, maybe the rate of increase will slow back to the norm, but I think the rent's probably not going to go down. Yeah, right. And so, well, you know, while the rent growth that we've seen over the last 12 months has been tremendous in certain cases, uh, we're certainly not projecting that for the future. And we, we do see it slowing down and, and uh, really getting back to normal. So yeah, that, that pretty much wraps it up for us. We do have a few minutes still for, for questions. So uh, we really appreciated the questions that came in so far and we really appreciate everyone sticking with us uh, on the live Zoom. So. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. And we'll, we'll, like I said, we'll hang around for some questions. But if there's, uh, you know, if you have to jump off, jump off, and we'll see you on the next one. You can just unshare. Yeah. So the next webinar, so we do these webinars quarterly. Uh, so the next one will be based on our Q4 deal flow, October, November, December. We'll have it in January, I believe. It'll be, we're trying to do these webinars on the, uh, the Thursday of the first week, first full week of the month. So basically the first Thursday of the month. And uh, this next Q, next uh, trade tracker one should be on uh, in January. And then next month and also quarterly, We'll, we have our uh, portfolio analysis webinar with our asset manager, Josh Hoffman and myself, where we look at data, not in our acquisitions pipeline, but data from our portfolio. And we try to derive insights for what we're seeing you know, within our portfolio itself. And so those are quarterly and the next one will be next uh, in, in November. Uh, and Naveen's also asking about, do we share the spreadsheet? Yes, so everybody who, um, you know, register for this webinar, you'll get a follow-up email with the recording of this webinar, as well as the template spreadsheet. So we're not going to be sharing the spreadsheet with the data in it uh, for this quarter, uh, but we will be sharing just a template. So if you want to take that template, make your own and, um, and use it for yourself, we, we highly recommend it. So that'll be available. All right, cool. Well, Hope this was helpful and, and it's uh it's definitely helpful for us as you guys can imagine um you know just the effort of putting the sheet together keeping it up to date and then and then presenting it we get a ton of value all right we're gonna sign off thank you guys so much i'll see you guys later